Welcome friends in New York, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and around the world. On the occasion of this week's publication of Unstoppable, Ziggy B. Wiltzig's astonishing journey from Holocaust survivor and penniless to Wall Street legend by Joshua M. Green, which coincided with the commemoration this past week of Yom HaShoah, it is my honor to partner with the worldwide organization, Jewish International Connection, Israel and Jewish International Connection, New York, and their partners, Kedma, the Tel Aviv International Synagogue, Alinu Kol Haneshama, and Jody's Voice for a lively Zoom conversation on the topic, why being unstoppable is often necessary when trying to accomplish the impossible. Joining Joshua will be speaker and special needs activist, Jody Samuels, author of Chutzpah, Wisdom and Wine, The Journey of an Unstoppable Woman, and Justice Richard Bernstein, a disabilities advocate and the first blind judge elected to Michigan's Supreme Court. Jody and Richard will react to the lessons from the life of Siggy Wiltzig, offering their own insights and personal experiences. Also up for discussion today is the tendency for unstoppability, a uniquely Jewish trait. But before I begin with my introduction of the panelists, a few words about the genesis of today's event and an exciting announcement. Audience members for today's event are eligible for free copies of Unstoppable and Chutzpah Wisdom and Wine. Please email info at jodysvoice.com. That is info at J-O-D-I-S-V-O-I-C-E.com. That is Jody's without the apostrophe. Ungrammatical, but perfect for email. And now for a few personal words. When I began working on the promotion for Unstoppable back in the fall, I was beset by a feeling akin to deja vu. The title of the book seemed familiar, but I was sure I hadn't heard of it until it landed on my desk. For the space of a month, I was haunted. Every time I said the word unstoppable, as in, I'm working on a new book called Unstoppable about Shoah survivor Siggy Wilsig, the author is this great guy named Joshua M. Green, I felt certain that I knew more about this project. It wasn't long before I realized that the very reason for this sense of familiarity was Jody's book, located just a few bookcases away, subtitled The Journey of an Unstoppable Woman. And indeed, for those of you who know Jody, you know that there was never a better subtitle in the history of subtitles. So I picked up my phone and I WhatsApp Jody, who might have been in Jerusalem or New York or Dubai, I simply don't remember. What I do remember is that I proposed doing a program with Joshua and that our program would smush the story of a Holocaust survivor with a South African Jewish woman who made Aliyah from her adopted home in New York. It made sense to us and made even more sense when Jody said, if we're talking about unstoppability, we need to include Richard Bernstein which of course we have succeeded in doing. So we'll be talking about a number of things today, fusing together the concepts of resilience, tenacity, survival, the legacy of the Shoah, special needs, advocacy, chutzpah, menschlichkeit, tikkun olam, derech eretz, tighten your seatbelts. The world has really changed over the past year. And to quote Rabbi Ann Brenner, a dear friend from Los Angeles who was a chaplain and social worker in addition to being a clergywoman and who spoke so movingly about mourning those lost to COVID on CNN two months ago, we need to remember that the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead, ends with the words, Oseh Shalom Bimromav, 
Huya Ase Shalom Aleinu Vialko Yisrael Vimru Amen. God who makes peace up on high, help us make peace here on earth and on all our brothers and sisters. I want to extend that prayer for us at this exact moment, marking the one year mark, a little over one year since the pandemic began. We need to emerge from the adversity, the loss, the suffering and mourning, better able to perfect the world and bring peace. So I will be introducing our panelists and just a few words for our audience. I will give an introduction and then I will turn the floor over to each panelist at a time and they will deliver, sorry to borrow courtroom words, but they will deliver their opening argument or opening statement, speaking from their position. And then we will open up to a conversation. And of course, comments and questions are more than welcome. Please send them along. So I will begin with the author of Unstoppable, Joshua M. Green. Joshua M. Green is a popular lecturer on Holocaust history and an author whose biographies have sold more than a half million copies worldwide. A former instructor at Hofstra and Fordham Universities, Green is the recipient of numerous awards for his books and films. Green's books include Justice at Dachau, The Trials of an American Prosecutor called Riveting Historical Writing at Its Best by Douglas Brinkley, Presidential Historian for CNN. His renowned work on survival testimony, Witness, Voices from the Holocaust, was the basis of a feature documentary for national PBS and chosen as one of the best Holocaust films by Facets Media. Green has been a featured speaker at the Pentagon and the Judge Advocate General's College. He was honored by the New York Public Library Distinguished Author Series and frequently lectures at state bar associations on issues of war crimes law. He has spoken on issues of Holocaust memory for such outlets as NPR, Fox News, and his editorials have appeared in print in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Chicago Tribune. Green sits on the board of the Yale University Video Archives for Holocaust Testimonies. Among his documentary films are Hitler's Court's Betrayal of the Rule of Law in Nazi Germany, which aired on PBS, and Memory After Belsen, The Future of Holocaust Remembrance for Discovery. He is recipient of five Best Program of the Year awards for TV Guide and an Emmy nomination for People, a Celebration of Diversity, which debuted at the United Nations. Currently, he teaches mindfulness in the workplace for the Tsar School of Business at Hofstra University. Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you for that. Uh bombastic introduction. I'll try not to disappoint you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, what an extraordinary uh, collection of um, co-panelists here. It's really an honor to be in such company. Let me see if I can just give you a brief idea of the history of this book. <clears throat> Unstoppable, the story of Siggy B. Wilzig, began eight years ago when the telephone rang and Siggy's son, I didn't know it at the time, said, um, I've read some of your other biographies. I think you're the man to write my father's story. Uh, I said, I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't want to go back into the darkness of the Holocaust. I want to write about the light. My, my life is about yoga and meditation. And the voice at the other end of the phone screamed back at me, yelled at me, no, 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 you don't understand. My father was the light. He was a beacon of hope for every immigrant who ever came to America. He started with nothing and ended up with an oil and banking empire with more than $4 billion in assets. He helped build the Washington Museum, went on and on and on. So I said, well, okay, let me look into it and I'll come back to you. I did some research and found that Ivan had not exaggerated his father's achievements. Siggy had come to America at age 21 in 1947, truly with nothing at all, a short fellow, five feet, five and a half inches, nothing more than a grade school education. 
but was truly, as the book title uh, suggests, unstoppable. If I may, I'd just like to read three paragraphs for you to give you an idea uh, of the setting of the scene of this story. The moment is his arrival in America and the highest organization has given him a room in Hotel Marseille, which was uh, an immigrant uh, halfway place uh, in those years on 103rd Street and Broadway here in New York. Sigbert looked out from his window down onto pedestrians heading home through blinding snow. Amazement over being in America was quickly giving way to harsh realities. What now, he wondered. He had nothing, no resources, no credentials. He spoke with a thick German accent, had only a grade school education, and years of torture and starvation were still fresh in his mind. Yet here he was, still breathing, staring out the window at snow-covered New York streets. By comparison with the past, everything here was a paradise. The bus ride to Harlem from Ellis Island had been paradise. The neighborhood grocery stores, high-rise apartment buildings and beer trucks, paradise. His smelly room in an overcrowded hotel with cockroaches scurrying across the scuffed hardwood floor, the heavy snowfall outside his window, the 200 remaining dollars in his pocket, which would soon disappear if he didn't find work. It was all paradise. On the street below his window, Weary pedestrians fought driving winds and six foot high snowdrifts, evoking for Sigbert harsh memories of other blinding storms when starving men and women trudged forward on death marches wearing nothing more than thin prisoner uniforms. Traffic in the New York streets snarled and drivers honked their horns impatient to get wherever they were going. Even to a 21 year old newcomer like Sigbert, it was clear that Americans who never knew the inside of a concentration camp, were alive in every sense, moving purposefully towards some vision of tomorrow. He liked that, he would do that too, grasp opportunities and not allow the darkness of the past to rob him of a bright future. In that seminal moment of his new life, Siegbert made three promises to himself. First, he would never go hungry again. Second, he would marry a Jewish woman, have children, and help rebuild the Jewish people. Third, he would preserve Holocaust memory and speak up whenever he witnessed injustice. He had no illusions about such vows. He knew better than to think he could change the world. Anti-Semitism would never go away and Jews would always be persecuted. That was just business as usual. Still, the Almighty had saved him. And now his job was to grab whatever scraps remained from the rubble of his life and cobble them back together into an edifice of yet to be determined size and shape. I read that because I wanted to underscore what I believe is a critical point about Holocaust memory. We're at a time when sadly the Holocaust is soon going to become another artifact of ancient history, like the French Revolution or the Roman Empire. And when that happens, and the survivor generation is no longer here to tell their own stories, how will the story be told? Who will tell the story? Through what media will it be told? And with what intended impact on its audiences? Uh, my privilege is to work with some extraordinary scholars in the area of Holocaust video testimony at the Fortunoff Archive at Yale University. They have a very particular approach to testimony. Their perspective is that we, the interviewers, are there just to listen. It's the survivors who are the experts in their own story. There's a difference, however, between oral testimonies, as, as we hear in taped or videotaped interviews, and a written biography. Now, the challenge for someone like me, frankly, is to get out of the way and to not try to prove that I have some literary skill. My job is to allow the survivors to tell their own stories in their own words. The good news for me writing Siggy Wilzig's story was that he had recorded more than 15 hours of testimony for the Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation. And I had all of those transcripts. I also had transcripts of other lectures he had given and his family was absolutely remarkable. His children, Ivan, Sherry and Alan took 
more than an active role. Every word, every sentence, every paragraph in this book has been vetted for them by them for accuracy. So what we have here are two very powerful ways of sustaining Holocaust memory, video testimony and biography or memoir such as Unstoppable. And what I discovered, the reason why I agreed to write this book was that in Siggy Wilsig, I, I, I guess I have to say it like this, I kind of fell in love with the man. There was something about him that said to me that even from the darkest place, it's possible to find a sliver of light. Siggy never gave up. He never suffered fools or bullies lightly at all. <laughs> I remember one story where uh, the Federal Reserve tried to get him to divest of one of his two companies, Wilshire Oil or Trust Company of New Jersey Bank. They said, it's a conflict of interest. You're a banker. What do you know about oil? Siggy went to Washington, walked into the boardroom of the Federal Reserve, <laughs> rolled up his sleeve and pointed to the prisoner number on his tattooed on his arm in Auschwitz and said, the last person to try to intimidate me was Hitler. He didn't succeed and neither are you. And he put his jacket back on and stormed out of the room and proceeded to beat them at their own game. That's the kind of moxie that um, gave me not only a good day, but a, a good seven years um, telling his story. And I, I'm grateful that for that opportunity and for a chance to share his story with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. And before I go to our next panelist, I once again, because so much went into bringing this event into being on the heels of Yom HaShoah, on the heels of Passover. And so again, I wanna thank our extraordinary sponsors, Jewish International Connection Israel, Jewish Interna International Connection New York, Kedma, the Tel Aviv International Synagogue, Alinu Kol HaNeshama, and Jody's voice. And Joshua, thank you so much. And we've been doing a few of these events every single time you speak. I get that same, that same excited feeling. All right. So Jody Samuels. Jody is an author, speaker, serial entrepreneur, world traveler, disability advocate, super mom, and wife. Jody founded the International Connection, Jewish International Connection, in order to provide community for Jews living abroad and hosts hundreds of events a year. So the thing you're seeing now, this is like a teeny little piece of what happens under Jody's watch. Jody is the author of Chutzpah, Wisdom and Wine, The Journey of an Unstoppable Woman, a memoir of facing life's ups and downs and overcoming challenges. She started Jody's Voice, in order to challenge people to overcome limiting perspectives and to inspire them to reach their full potential. Jody's writing appears on her own blog, as well as the Times of Israel, the Jerusalem Post, Aisha Torah, and the Jewish View. Jody lives in Jerusalem with her husband, Gavin, and their three children. Jody, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is a great project. I'm so excited to be associated with the unstoppable people involved in this. You know, this is my story. My husband and I were leading what I thought was the perfect life. I'd met my husband when I was in my gap year after school. I was 18, we were both just becoming religious and he was lost and he asked me if I speak English and we met on a street corner. And from there, we continued to live like the most exciting life. He was working for the flying doctor service in Australia. We lived in five countries. We lived in nine cities. We won green cards to New York City. We were gonna live the dream. I was always grateful for the fact that I found my husband when I was young. I was so passionate about the fact that I had found my Judaism and I wanted to inspire others to live a life with meaning. In 2008, 
here we were in New York City. We had great jobs. We had two adorable kids and we had an open home. And when I say open home, I mean, quite literally thousands and thousands of people came to our home every year for Shabbat dinners, classes, events. And on February 25th, 2008, Kayla was born. I had a mother's intuition that something was wrong. My husband's a doctor. He was like, well, all the scans, everything's fine. I went to the OBGYN, everything's fine. But I knew something just wasn't right. When they were prepping me for the cesarean, and pray, God, please give me a healthy baby. I was like, God, please give me the strength to deal with what comes my way. And Kayla was born and she was perfect. And we sent an email out to the 8,000 people on the list of my organization before Facebook and all these other ways of communicating. Mom and baby are doing well. On day three of Kayla's life, a doctor walked in and said the words that would change our lives. Mrs. Samuels, did you do genetic testing? I knew, I knew what he was gonna say. He didn't have to say it. I sat bolt upright, I'd had a cesarean. I was in pain. And I knew he was gonna propose the diagnosis of Down syndrome. And I was overcome with terror, fear, I knew what Down syndrome was. In fact, I have a first cousin with Down syndrome. I mean, how was I gonna be unstoppable? I hadn't yet made it to the front page of Fortune and Forbes and every business magazine. I had only been to about 40 countries. I wanted to see the world. How was I gonna host thousands of people? And I was on a mission to change the world in my own way, even if it was in my own corner of the world. And I was like, why us, why me? And I went to the restroom within half an hour of getting the news. And I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, you know, we have an open home, a home that allows hundreds of people in. And when I say open, literally our door was always open. And I was like, if we're inviting in the searching, every type of person under the sun, we weren't no judgment. I was like, how can I not welcome my own child? My whole life would be a lie. I'd had two miscarriages between my middle child and Kayla. And I really felt God wanted this child to be in our family. Thank God Gavin was on the same page. When we left the hospital, they check your hospital band to make sure you're the right parents. And Gavin joked, they should just write advocate and activist on our forehead. Little did he know how prophetic that would be. On Kayla's fourth day of life, I was already defending her right to exist. When a neighbor came over, I was holding the baby and she's like, what? You didn't do an amniocentesis and abort? How could you? And there I was. And then I understood in that moment, if we were gonna change the world for Kayla, it was we who were gonna change the world for Kayla. And I knew it was gonna be my responsibility to change that knee jerk reaction to a child with a disability. We didn't realize that just two years later, when we wanted our daughter to go to a community Jewish day school, the answer would be no. They didn't meet her, they didn't assess her. The answer was simply no. And we were locked out. We we're locked out of school. We we're locked out of community. And I was devastated. Here I am, a bold chover, spent so much time choosing my life. And we were locked out. And we went on a mission to change this verdict, so to speak. And we made our campaign line to do not what's easy, but what's right. And the answer was still no. At that point, there was this opportunity, as it says in Pirkei Avot, when there's no man to be the man, when there's no leader to be the leader. And I started organizing community forums to highlight this issue because I realized so many people didn't understand. Now, don't get me wrong. I was always a doer. I was always the person behind the scene, but I never spoke in public. 
And I arrived at my own event and anybody who lives in New York, there was all this media there and there were all these trucks outside with their lights. And I was like, oh my gosh, this was like lights, camera, action. And they want you to interview me. And I had to find my voice. I had to go from being the shy behind the scenes person to Mama Grizzly and start advocating for my child. Needless to say, we endured threats. It was a major challenge. In fact, Justice Bernstein at the time was a disability lawyer and we brought him in to help us with our fight. And I had one of those moments where a leading member of the community wrote in an email, you chose to bring this problem into the world. Don't make your problem our problem. I'm sorry, I didn't choose to bring this problem into the world. God chose to bring the problem into the world. And in a city where everything goes, I didn't have the right to choose to bring my child into the world. And from there I launched into advocacy. I teach in person, writing, social media. And now Kayla is a teenager. We made Aliyah, it's different issues, but I am Kayla's voice. I'm always advocating for her and making sure that she too has the opportunity to be unstoppable. Thank you, Jody. That is um, not only moving, but the most perfect segue for my introduction for Justice Richard Bernstein. Justice Richard Bernstein became the first blind justice elected by voters statewide to the Michigan Supreme Court in November 2014. With a commitment to justice and fairness, Bernstein began his eight year term in January 2015. Prior to being elected to Michigan's highest court, Justice Bernstein was known as a tireless advocate for dis disabled rights as an attorney, heading the public service division for the Sam Bernstein law firm in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Blind since birth, Justice Bernstein is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Michigan and earned his Juris Doctorate from Northwestern University School of Law. Committed to taking action to help clients who needed him, Justice Bernstein's cases often set national standards protecting the rights and safety of people with and without disabilities. In his spare time, Justice Bernstein is an avid runner, completing 22 marathons, including 13 New York City marathons, the full Ironman triathlon in, and am I pronouncing this correctly, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho? in uh, 2008, and the Israman Triathlon Half Ironman in Eilat, Israel in 2011. He also previously co-hosted a one hour legal radio show called Fighting for Justice on WCHBAM 1200 in Metro Detroit. And now I turn the floor to Justice Bernstein. I think people ask a question, what are the qualities that go into being a good judge? You're making decisions that ultimately affect people's entire lives, their freedom, their families, their communities. And people would often say, well, to be a good judge, isn't it really about your academics, your intellectualism, your ability to research, to write, and to publish? And I would always say back, those aren't really the qualities that go into being a good jurist. And I think what we've heard here tonight from our panelists embodies that, that notion. And I think it embodies it because it really comes down to none of those qualities matter for being a good judge. What matters is your life experience. And often the best judges, the people who can make the most profound decisions are the people who understand struggle and understand hardship and understand difficulty. It's only the people that can understand that true essence of what it means to struggle, 
that I believe have God's greatest gift, the ability to understand, the ability to connect, and the ability to empathize. And I think when we talk about our live stories and we introduce ourselves to the audience, I think these panelists go to this question, which is why is it that if God is so good, he allows for such bad things to happen to otherwise such fine people? And I think what this panel comes down to is this notion. Why is it that there are some people who have to know a greater hardship or greater challenge than others? And I would say from my life experiences that it comes down to what Jody had indicated. It comes down to having an understanding and appreciation of why you were created, but most importantly, what you were ultimately sent here to do. Now, it's interesting. When my situation developed as a blind person, I remember my mom telling me a story that on the day that uh, I was born, the rabbi came to visit us and he said to my mom when it was kind of uncertain as to what the future was going to be, that no matter what, your son will be bar mitzvah. And to my parents, that meant the world. But I think the essence of tonight is this notion. Life can change and it can change so quickly. And you never know what's gonna happen. You never know where you're gonna be and you never know what experiences you're ultimately going to be able to have and for ultimately what things God has truly in store for you. But I think the thing that I've kind of taken in my life experience as a person who was born blind, as a person who had to struggle to go through school, as a person who didn't quite fit in when he was growing up and kind of learned certain lessons. And the lesson that I kind of took is that sometimes, especially for the young people who are joining us tonight, when you're gonna go through certain phases, whether it's middle school or high school, and you're gonna struggle because you're not gonna do as well as you had hoped, you're not gonna have a lot of friends, you're not gonna be the most popular, and you're simply gonna find it hard to wake up every day. Remember this notion that life really does change. And for most people, when it changes, it ultimately gets better because you find your way. And as Jody indicated, you're able to find your voice. I spent my life dedicating myself for ultimately there was one night in Chicago that defined my journey. It was a cold January night and the wind was blowing off of Lake Michigan. And I remember saying to myself and ultimately reaching up to the heavens and praying to Hashem and saying to him, God, I want to be a lawyer in the absolute worst way. Now, all of my friends had it a little bit easier. They didn't have to struggle. Their grades came easy. It wasn't as brutal as it was for me. But I wanted to be a lawyer in the worst way. I could taste it. I could sense it. I wanted it because I knew that if I could obtain that law degree, that I could do something with it. And on that cold night on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, I made a promise to Hashem. And I said to him, I said, Hashem, if you give me the opportunity to become a lawyer and pass the bar, then I will dedicate my entire life to fighting for people with disabilities, fighting for folks with special needs, and fighting for people who live in the shadows. I just need this law degree. I just need to let me have this. And if you do that, this will be my entire life's work. And miraculously, I graduated from Northwestern, even more miraculous, I actually passed the bar and I went back to my family's practice and I said, a promise is a promise. God gave me this law degree, but in return, I now have to honor my commitment and dedicate myself to doing pro bono. And even more miraculous, my family agreed and we set up a public services division where we never charge for legal representation. And because we never charged, we could take on the cases that nobody else would take on. And we could fight for folks who really didn't have anywhere else to go. And I can honestly tell you that when you get into these battles and when you get into these fights, the way that we would get into them, and it would be me and Tim McLean and Emily Kramer who would be working in our little division, 
And we'd be fighting with Delta Airlines. We'd be fighting with the University of Michigan. We'd be fighting with the city of Detroit. We'd be fighting with different counties and different governments. We'd be fighting with massive law firms where there would exist a true David versus Goliath struggle. And ultimately, if you looked at every one of these cases, we never should have won because it were outgunned and outmanned at every turn. But in every case, some miraculous thing would happen that would turn the tide and allow for justice to be done so that veterans could go to Michigan Stadium, so people could use public transportation, so that people with disabilities could fly. In my last remaining moments, I'll say that what I have been blessed to experience in my life was through those experiences, through those battles, I came to realize that ultimately we could make some change in the court system. By becoming a Supreme Court justice, not only are you making decisions that are the final decision for the entire state of Michigan, but you're administering over 800 judges that report to the highest court. And when you're serving in this position, you have the opportunity to create the administrative rules and protocols that are necessary to allow for all people to have justice. And what was amazing about life is when we look at how difficult things are, when we look at how challenging things are, when we look at how toxic we might think the political environment is, in the great state of Michigan, a question was put to the voters. Are you comfortable with having a person who is blind serving on your highest court? For years, we've always been trying to have equality when you talk about disabilities. But this was gonna be the first time that we were gonna pose a real question, not just whether or not you were comfortable with a disabled person being your peer, but were you comfortable with a disabled person making decisions that were going to affect your life, your community, your way of life? And what happened in this election as we traveled across the great state from city to city and town to town is the answer was yes, because people felt that, you know what? A disabled person can understand my challenges, my hardships, my difficulties, my pain and my struggle. And I'll simply end with this. If this had been a nomination process where you had to go in front of a committee and the committee would make the decision as to who would have this position, I would never be elected or never had the chance to serve. Because what people would have done is they would have said, oh, that's so great that that disabled guy wants to be a judge, but they never would have allowed it. But when you take your case to the people directly and you have that connection with people, people understand passion. They understand energy. They understand spirit and they understand commitment. But most importantly, what the panelists here today are able to bring forth through our stories is that people respect struggle. And it's through struggle that change happens. And it's through change that life gets better because ultimately what you find from the notion of unstoppable is simply this. So often, for many of us, our bodies are mortal and we are infirmed. But it's always the people who struggle that have the greatest and most powerful and most overwhelming spirits. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Justice Bernstein. So I just wanna say on a personal note, I knew this was gonna be interesting. I didn't know I was gonna be so far clamped at this point, but I thank you and, um, while I'm listening to Joshua, Jody, and you, Richard, um, I want to ask each of you to reflect on different facets of this unstoppability, this rising against struggle, um, being forged by adversity. So if I could turn Joshua first to you, can you speak to the concept of resilience? and how you come to understand this through the life of Ziggy and also other people who have gone through the Shoah, what it means and also what it doesn't mean. Um, 
it's a it's a very challenging subject. We have a tendency to look for those moments of um, strength, resistance, um, courage, bravery, because when we talk about the Holocaust, we're talking about an arena that's so dark, atrocities on such scale and depth that they, they stagger the imagination. And we want to believe that there is some kind of redemptive quality that we can find in it, that it will show us that we humans have a, an intractable desire to live, that the human spirit can rise above even the most difficult of circumstances. I think we have to be careful, however, to not impose redemptive messages on an arena where there really were very few. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that we want to believe something and we will interpret it in a way to arrive at that foregone conclusion. What I find listening to testimony by Holocaust witnesses, survivors, and others, liberation soldiers, and so on, is that they don't describe themselves as heroes. They very often talk about the unheroic things they were forced to do just to survive. If there was some counter message within the story of Siggy Wilson, it was not that he was able to put all of the horror behind him, but rather he found a way to manage his nightmares. I think that would be an important distinction to make. He once described for an interviewer that he had nightmares every night of his life and they were so terrible he did not like to talk about them. One that I will share with you is he would dream of his own children walking into the flames of the crematorium fires. And then he said, I'll tell you something I've never admitted before. I don't think I could live without the nightmares because they show me a hyper-realistic vision of the beauty and the blessings of life, particularly as a Jew, and I would never want to give that up. So I think we want to temper our understanding of these noble qualities by recognizing that when we speak about witnesses to the, to the Holocaust, there's always this secondary theme of the horror of the past never going away. And that what we see is perhaps all the more extraordinary by virtue of them continuing to live with the memory of what they've been through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, thank you. And Jody, um, before we get to you, I do want to remind everybody, post your questions. I've been getting some good questions. And also, please, to get free copies of the book, please email info at jodysvoice.com. That's info at J-O-D-I-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. So Jody, you and I have spoken quite a lot about the concept of tenacity. And if we could, uh, if you could actually address this now, talk about tenacity, talk about chutzpah. Tenacity is a good thing. Chutzpah is in your title of your book. What are the outer limits of chutzpah? When, is, when does chutzpah turn from being an effective thing, a great thing, um, to something not so hot? Great. You know, Shira, I think that when I read Unstoppable and I hear Richard's story, Justice Bernstein's story, I think there's a common theme in everybody who achieves so much. And that is that, whoops, okay. That is that chutzpah, wisdom, and wine is a common theme. So firstly, let me put in a background. If you don't know what you're living for, then your life is not worth living. Everybody needs that perspective in order to go out and pivot in the face of crisis, change, Survivors went through the most unimaginable horrors. 
yet they had to come up and find meaning in what happened. And I think that the concept of chutzpah, wisdom and wine in so many ways defines this. And let me explain. I'm going to say wine first. I think wine is the metaphor for taking time out, stopping and realizing what you have and appreciating what you have. And I think there was like that moment in the book when Sigi arrived in the US and no matter what he had been through, he realized people here are alive and they're living. And he was able to appreciate the blessing that he had to be at that point. And I believe that meaning, and I think that's such a powerful concept for all Jewish people who have gone through so much, is this Torah wisdom, to values, Jewish values that are infused. That timeless wisdom that's part of our culture, that's part of our language, is our guide, it's our teacher, it's our map. And it comes through in so many ways, in Siggy's story, in my story, in Richard's story, and for so many other people. And then we get to your question about chutzpah. So I think chutzpah is such an essential ingredient. Now, a lot of people associate chutzpah with this like negative rude, but I'm gonna share with you my view of chutzpah and why I even named my book chutzpah. And that is chutzpah is about being determined. It's about being courageous and it's about being optimistic. It's about being optimistic that you can make a difference, that you can choose. And you know, when you have chutzpah, you're passionate. And when you're passionate, you're excited and you move forward. And you also know that it's not only about the end goal, you know it's about the journey. And hence, if you understand it's about the journey, you're not scared of falling down, you're not scared of failing, and you know to look forward. And you know that I always say like to me, chutzpah is caffeine to the soul. It's what gives you that like energy burst to focus, to move forward. And it's also, and I think this is such an incredible part of Richard's story, Siggy's story. It's a lack of the fear of the word no. If you really think about the startup nation in Israel, you think about people who no matter what have they been through in their lives, it's that ability to say, you know what, I'm just not going to be afraid of failing, of the word no, of looking, I'm going to look forward, I'm not going to look back. As painful as everything is, and as much as you sometimes have to compartmentalize, it's a lack of the fear of the word no. And it's also an essential ingredient of being flexible. When you have chutzpah, it's like you understand that life doesn't always work out as you want, that you're not always given the cards in life that you want the perfect hand. And that, yes, you have to sometimes pivot in the face of change. And I think that in our modern world, we've many people were living this like otherwise I call perfect life. And then the big C arrived. COVID. And so many people suddenly had to like just pivot, change their perspectives, figure out in so many ways, whether it was being working from home with your children or figuring out how to stay locked up alone or dealing with loneliness. There were so many things that changed. Or well, the fact that the only thing we know for sure now is we know absolutely nothing for sure. And we had like lived in this like la la land in this perfect world in a modern generation. And now everybody needs a dose of this positive chutzpah. And I hope that everybody can take it and go out there and realize that you have an opportunity, you choose. And chutzpah is that essential ingredient in going out there and being determined and courageous and choosing to be a victor in the story. Jody, thank you, thank you. And finally, uh, Richard, I want to ask you, and I know you hinted at this in your remarks, and I have to tell you, as the daughter of a rabbi, I related so to your the story you told of the rabbi reassuring your parents as a little boy, as an infant, that you would have a bar mitzvah, 
So I want to ask you, could you elaborate on the following question? Is unstoppability a uniquely Jewish trait? And in your life, what about your unstoppability is connected to your Jewish heritage? That's a beautiful question. I would say that it's the Judaism that gives you the spiritual framework that you ultimately operate from. And I think what we're all looking for is we're all looking for connection. And I think that's what truly tends to drive us. And I'll just kind of share with you a story is, is that I've always used athletics to kind of find my strength and to give me a sense of identity. And I have a wonderful running club called Achilles that I run with. And as a result, we've been able to do 24 marathons and a full Ironman competition. And the reason that I mention this is because you run with a team and they give you directional cues, hard right, soft right, hard left, soft left. And you follow those directional cues as you complete the race. And I just wanna kind of take you, if I could, to the day of the Ironman. And when you dive into Lake Coeur d'Alene, the water temperature that morning was 55 degrees. So when you dive in, you actually start to have convulsions because the water is so cold. And I want you to picture what it's like to swim in total darkness. You don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You get kicked in the face by all the other swimmers. And ultimately, other competitors become entangled in the rope that connects you to your guide. And it starts taking you below the wave line. So you start to feel an actual drowning sensation. Mm -hmm. And the reason I kind of share this story with you is that of course you do your, you know, you do 2.4 mile swim, you do your 112 mile bike, and you do your 26.2 mile run. And I think what Judaism has ultimately kind of taught me is, is that we're all looking for that connection with Hashem. We want to have that relationship with him. And I think what it really comes down to is, is that it's easy to have a relationship with the creator when life is going well, when your business is going well, when your health is in good position. And it's easy to have that, that, that connection when life is good. But I think the real question kind of develops is what type of a connection do you have when there's some struggle, when things aren't going so well, and when the future is uncertain? And it's going to kind of conclude by this, going to the idea that life can change in an instant. So here I was, a person who had used athletics to kind of find my voice. And there was one day in Central Park, and I was walking in the pedestrian lane, and a bicyclist was traveling about 35 miles an hour, and he lost control and struck me directly in the back. And at that point, I had done 17 marathons and a full Ironman. But the accident was so intense that it shattered all parts of my body. And I wound up having to live at Mount Sinai Hospital for over 10 weeks. And in that time, you come to realize that through spirituality, that life is not about the big things. It's always about the little things. You know, the ability to be outside or the ability to go to a restaurant or the ability to be with people. It's the little things that you really crave and you really start to miss. And in my situation, I had gone from being an Ironman and a 17 time marathoner at that point to a person that really couldn't even move my leg without agonizing pain. And so the anger and the fury that you have with God is just impossible to really describe. But I'll just say this in kind of conclusion is, is that over time, you come to realize that in life, you can't spend all your time, you know, often trying, people will say, oh, you're gonna make a full recovery. Well, most people aren't gonna make a full recovery. The key to it is how do you adapt? It's finding a way to adapt to your new life, to your new circumstance, to your new situation. The power comes in adapting to a life that you might not want or that you didn't expect, but figuring out how you're going to adapt. And I'll just conclude by saying this. We ran the New York City Marathon after I got out of the hospital. I said to Hashem, I said, please just let me have this. I want this in the worst way. Just allow me to finish this race. And we crossed the 59th Street Bridge. We began running up First Avenue at mile 18. 
the pain was becoming so intensive and so severe that I remember reaching up to the heavens and saying to Hashem, please, Hashem, please, just let me have this. This is all I want. Please let me cross the finish line. But this pain is becoming so grueling that I'm worried I'm going to lose consciousness. And to end this comment, I'm going to tell you this. It was right at that moment when you ask about spirituality and Judaism, when the storm is raging and the pain is so severe and the intensity is beyond description, that you come to find what you're looking for, you make peace, peace with your new body, peace with your new circumstance, peace with your new life. But most importantly, when the storm is raging and the pain is so severe, you ask about Judaism, you ask about spirituality. It was at that moment and at that time that I was able to find my peace with Hashem. Thank you. Wow. And that links back to the Ose Shalom Bim Romav at the end of the Kaddish prayer. God who makes peace on high, send peace down here to, to us, we who need help. So unbelievably, we have come almost to the end, pretty much to the end of our, of our time. There are a few questions. I'm going to ask only one. Um, and Jody, Jody, it is a question to you. The question is, how, what kind of awareness does your daughter have of her needs, her special needs, and how do you, as a mother, talk to her about it and <laughs> encourage her to be her unstoppable self? Okay, well, I think whoever posed that question is asking the million dollar question in my life because my daughter spends her life in two worlds. She's very aware, like, so she's incredibly high functioning, which is a blessing. And it's also a challenge because she's not blissfully unaware. 